So let's talk a little bit about what's available right now in terms of, God forbid, if you get COVID, uh, you know, infection, what's out there? Do you want to talk about what's the indication for the monoclonal antibodies infusion, Sandeep? Uh, yeah, the indications uh, they have outlined, I think the, uh, you know, the Florida governor and other people and agencies are uh, promoting it as an available tool uh, to combat early disease, uh, to prevent progression, uh, especially in patients or people at higher risk for progression. So people who have uh, risk factors for coron the identified ones, obesity, immunocompromised, heart disease, COPD, chronic lung disease, if you're on biologic agents, if you have immunodeficiencies that are genetic, um, and a whole list of others. Uh, they are there on the websites uh, if you look them up. Uh, so if you qualify, have any of these risk factors and you test positive for coronavirus, you have about a 10-day window in which you could avail of these monoclonal antibodies uh, as long as you don't have advanced disease. Uh, by that, they mean uh, that you require oxygen or you are sick enough to be hospitalized. You're outpatient, you have mild symptoms, you're in 10 days, you've tested positive, and you have a risk for progression. There is a lot of leeway in that list. Uh, so your physician has discretion uh, in determining whether you are at uh, risk for progression and then can recommend uh, the monoclonal antibody. The three preparations that you had listed on the slide uh, are available. Uh, this bamblanimab and uh, estemimab was uh, uh, paused a little bit uh, for a few weeks to months, but now it has come again. Uh, it was paused because there was thought that the beta and gamma variants uh, had escaped through that thing. Uh, however, it is known that it works against Delta, so they've brought it back online now. Um, Regeneron's preparation, that is carisimab and imdemimab, uh, works against Delta. Sotrovimab also works. Uh, so those three are available. Of course, now with promotion and the current uh, high predominance of Delta and so-called third wave, with so many cases uh, being diagnosed, there is a huge demand for these antibodies. Uh, so there may be supply issues. So wherever you go, please call and make sure they have it. Otherwise, you'll be chasing and wasting time. Um, they are given IV. Um, some of them can also be given subcutaneously if an IV infusion cannot be given. Um, and minimal side effects, I think rash and all those things with any injectable can be anticipated, but they are minor, uh, well tolerated, and uh, efficacious. So uh, can prevent progression to moderate or severe disease and the other spectrum of illness. Yeah, but <clears throat> this is the last resort. You know, if you're vaccinated, then, you know, your chances of needing this is less. So, but if you're not vaccinated, um, you know, then you're looking at this as a, for milder disease, you know, for serious disease, you're still ending up in the hospital with, for, with oxygen support and all that. So, right. yeah. So, right. yes, so it's a good tool, you know, and um, you know, a lot of local urgent cares and um, are offering it too. So, you know, uh, it's getting uh, easily available, but now a lot of people are using, as you were saying earlier, it's getting a little bit tighter supply, but still call around and you may uh, get, uh, and we have a number here. We'll put it back up on there. So you can call the, this number. Yeah, there is a Florida yeah, helpline number somewhere. Here. Uh, 1866 number, which you can call yeah. and they can guide you where they have the inventory. Um, all right, so let's go to the next slide, Sandeep. Uh, so this talks, we already covered that piece. Uh, let's just uh, revise it. So basically what happened if you, God forbid, get hospitalized? So yeah, this is just, um, just an overview, um, sort of what to expect kind of situation. Um, you can always bring it up with your treating physicians. Uh, they can be your primary care hospitalist doctor. Sometimes infectious disease doctors are involved um, and pulmonology or critical care medicine doctors are involved. Um, and it's, it's a tiered approach, you know, depending on how sick you get. Uh, but if you're hospitalized and you need oxygen, then 
dexamethasone is the mainstay of treatment <clears throat> because in trials it has shown mortality benefit. Um, then in early disease, if you are about 10 days into the illness, you probably still have a replicating virus. So an antiviral medication like remdesivir has a chance of intervening. It hasn't shown any mortality benefit. Uh, in trials, it has shown that the duration of illness can be reduced, uh, but to the extent that can be achieved, it can be done if it's given early enough. Um, so those are the options in the beginning. If you advance and require high flow oxygen or you need escalating doses of oxygen, then other modes of treatment are considered. Uh, which include uh, the anti-inflammatory agents along with the steroids or on top of the steroids. Those are the IL-6 inhibitors or JAK inhibitors. Um, those are drugs that are designed for other maladies, uh, inflammatory conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and such. Uh, those, because of their anti-inflammatory properties, have been tried and have shown some benefit uh, to varying degrees depending on patient selection um, that can afford uh, some benefit in the severe cases. Um, and we have, we have used them with varying degree of success. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, if you need escalating doses of oxygen, then you need sometimes non-invasive ventilation, that is the CPAP, IPAP, and then eventually progresses to... Um, intubation and mechanical ventilation in some people. Um, but hopefully all that can be avoided uh, if we just prevent the virus from attacking us in the first place by doing these simple basic interventions of masking, social distancing, and uh, getting the vaccines as soon as one can get it. Let's talk about the hot topic now, the booster dose of the, you know, the third dose. Um, you know, the CDC has said for um, for right now, the FDA has not intervened on the White House is talking about the third dose, but the CDC has only talked about immunocompromised people, you know, people on chemo, people on transplant medication, people on biologics for uh, inflammatory arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease. Those are people, CDC, is saying they should go irrespective when is their second dose to get the third dose, correct? That's correct. And that is the distinction that they're making between a booster versus an additional dose or a third dose. It's almost as if the vaccination series is extended to bring those people into the wraps uh, who may have not had an adequate response to the first two doses and their immunity is maybe waning sooner uh, than in otherwise healthy people who have responded well to give them additional protection, especially since uh, there are very minimal downsides to the vaccine. So this is an advantage that can be gained uh, if you take the third dose. Um, but the booster is still away. I don't think it is decided yet. We'll have to wait for FDA, CDC, and the ACIP to make their recommendations. Uh, they are all actively considering it. Um, the administration had put in a deadline or a goal post of about, uh, I think, September 28th uh, for the decision making. We'll see if they get any decisions before then or not. And even if it were made, the question again is, you know, how much vaccine is there in the supply chain? I just don't know that. And whether if it does become uh, approved or recommended, then how are we going to get it? I think it's still going to be a tiered approach when it comes you know, the most people at risk um, will probably get it first in the order that it was given the first time, uh, kind of that kind of priority list. Uh, immunocompromised people, people at high risk, of course, will be in the front of the line. Uh, and then the other factor is the timeline. You know, the immunity is known to kind of wane seventh, eighth month around that time frame. So if you are that many months away from your second dose, um, then uh, it's about time to get the third dose or the booster dose uh, when approved. Well, that's good insight and people should not be, you know, jumping the line, you know, right now, just let the dust settle down and see what the CDC Yeah, there is no reason to panic. Yeah. Meaning, um, you know, the vaccines are doing the job. Yeah. It has protected so far. There are very few vaccinated people who are getting breakthrough infections. The number is really, really very low when you put it in big scheme of things. Um, so yeah, need to avoid a sense of panic. Uh, what is being done is being done. 
uh, if you what, do the precautions of not getting the right. variant, then that will be more important than trying to rush into a third dose. Right. What's your take on, let's say, if someone took J and J vaccine, um, and if they are immunocompromised, should they take the one of the mRNA vaccine, or do you have any literature to support that, or what's your take? No, we just don't know. I think uh, what we can say is probably the mRNA vaccines are interchangeable, not advised, but probably okay if one vaccine is not available, you could take the other one. But I would make a good effort to find the original one uh, because it's not an emergency to get it. Uh, so you could wait a few weeks to get the dose, uh, but try and get the same preparation. Uh, that is a recommendation right now. As far as crossing over uh, and taking uh, the J and J vaccine uh, after you've taken the mRNA vaccine, probably is not a good idea. I think you need to stay with the same preparation. I think uh, you know. It, the as we evolve, they are, you know, everyone learning from it. So uh, there'll be better answers maybe next year. You know, right now we are just... right, and they are studying this. There are post marketing data coming in. Uh, but again, the question is, how are they going to find people who have gotten both preparations? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, is, that's going to be a trick of sifting right. through everything and then seeing there may be travelers you know they got it here then they got it there the students who are migrating from universities i'm sure they'll find some some data set unless they're actually mm -hmm. studying it by giving it yeah. so uh, let's just you know get to the what's new out there in covid i know there is a new strain out there called mu strain or mu strain which is after the alpha beta and gamma and delta which you alluded to earlier um, what we know so far about mu strain uh, that, you know, I know Not of it's more Latin American yeah. origin from Chile, Peru, you know, in that countries, and it's in yeah, Colombia, they, they it's 39%. Um, you, you want to say something? I'm sorry. Let me bring you up. Sorry, no, I'm bad. Yeah, I yeah, uh, didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, the mu strain, um, you know, in the Latin American countries. They talked about it in 13 other, 39 other countries, I think. And, um, but it's not one of the predominant circulating strains in US in any of the territories. Um, you mentioned that uh, when we talked earlier about Delta, that it was 80%. Uh, actually, the numbers are even higher. Um, the last time I looked at the CDC countywide data, uh, it was in the 92 to 98% range. So almost all of the infections that are currently going on in high risk or high transmission zones are from Delta virus, De Delta variant. And um, so mu may or may not come. If it does come and becomes and replaces the Delta variant, uh, there are some concerns about uh, will it have vac vaccine escape or uh, monoclonal antibody escape, uh, and that remains to be seen. Uh, there is concern right now. It is a variant of concern uh, that uh, these may happen, but again, we don't know for sure. Uh, so nothing yet to change practice. Uh, stick with what you're doing. That's a good point. You know, there's no point worrying about the dizzying data we're getting on these variants because that's the nature of the virus. You're going to have variants, I think. Uh, right, and it has to establish itself. It has to become a dominant one in your community for you to be really worried about it. Right. There may be pockets here and there. You know, coverage of vaccines is increasing. So there may be, you know, a zone, say, 10 miles around us that is adequately vaccinated. And there may be a zone, again, after 30 miles that maybe is not vaccinated. So those, those will be the vulnerable areas uh, and then it will take some time. It will eventually spread depending on how transmissible it is and how many vulnerable people there are. Uh, but again, your best defense is increasing the vaccination rate, getting it way up there and doing these basic things of masking and uh, social distancing, in, especially in high transmission areas. So that brings us to the take home messages from our talk and they are very simple. They're nothing fancy. You know, the virus is going to be around longer and it's going to 
become endemic eventually from pandemic. So, you know, we need to learn to live with COVID-19, whether it's education, whether uh, it's, um, you know, hospitals, whether it's physicians, whether it's patients, the communities, community leaders, everyone needs to learn to live with it. And, um, you know, if you follow the simple thought processes of social distancing, as Dr. Padan mentioned, getting vaccinated, very effective vaccines we have, very safe vaccines we have, using, you know, social distancing, washing your hands, hand hygienes. Not only it will help us with this pandemic, you know, I think there are lessons learned from in, in other countries which went through, uh, you know, the pandemics before, which were similar uh, in terms of masking and hand washing and that helped those countries to keep the COVID-19 numbers down because they were less resistant than let's say, you know, the Western countries in terms of uh, getting those masks and the hand washing things, uh, you know, implemented in the community. So I think yeah, we uh, just need, yeah, go ahead. Ranjit, one point I wanted to make, I just thought of it is about masks. Um, so earlier there was just conjecture, right? Or theory or belief that it works. There is actually now trial data recently, a new big 350,000 patient trial from Bangladesh uh, came out where they randomized, you know, two villages, 600 villages, 300 and 300, I believe. And those will, one village, that group of villages were unmasked and some, this group of villages were masked mm -hmm. and the infection rates were much lower in guess which group, the people that, the group that masked. Uh, almost by 13% lower. And in the older people in that subgroup, if they were 60 or older, the protection was even higher, up to even 35%. This was done by researchers from Stanford and Yale as a joint, Yale University as a joint effort uh, in Bangladesh. I guess they could get it done there ethically. And uh, so, yeah, so that kind of settles it for me on the mask issue. Right. So, you know, um, the model of the story is the viruses are going to be, they've been there before we were there. <laughs> They'll be there even when, God forbid, we are gone as a race. So we got to coexist and, and you know, uh, do the simple things which are not hard to do and get your, uh, you know, whatever your resistance could be, you know, that could be uh, very important what your thoughts are, why you don't want a vaccine or why you don't want to use a mask, you know, and all those are important, but if we don't work together, you know, the, the, the pandemic will keep causing more and more mortality and more and more um, morbidity too. You know, mortality is sad, but morbidity you have to live with and the families have to live with long haul COVID or, you know, pulmonary fibrosis and needing oxygen and needing not able to work afterwards, you know, with uh, not able to breathe. So they are serious, serious. And, and look at the healthcare toll it's taking on the nurses and the respiratory therapists. They are- And, they are and the economy and the supply chain worldwide, meaning there is a big larger picture out there. And if we all crave for those good old days, hmm. but the good old days are not coming unless you do something about this. And what's in your hands is masking, social distancing and vaccination. And there is a hope and good news too, you know, that if you uh, look at all the previous pandemics, you know, like polio, for example, you know, there was stutters in terms of getting the vaccines right with polio. And finally they got the vaccine right. And you look at very small pockets left in the world, uh, you know, few countries in Asia and Africa where you get polio cases, but used to be, you know, 40, 50 years ago, not too long ago that, you know, the kids were having, you know, all kind of complication from polio and deaths. So, you know, all these viruses uh, are there, but if we follow simple, uh, you know, instructions from the community, scientific community, they could be tamed and we've done that before. So there is no reason to lose hope. And uh, 
um, and do the right thing, get the vaccine and do the masking, wash your hands and, and you know, we'll all will overcome this as a... Yeah, community. I think it's just a matter of time. It, it's going to be, the question is how soon, and that's really up to us. 